Hi guys. Welcome back. So um, this is the third lesson of transition metals and I think in the previous lesson we want to take a look at what we have gone through first mm -hmm. uh, which is the idea of a complex. So Mr. Tim, can you remind me again right, there are two important components uh, that's present in a complex. Mm -hmm. uh, what are they? Well, first things first, you need a mm. transition metal ion in okay. the centre, right? mm -hmm. and surrounding it, you need ligands, right? Okay. Mm. Uh, what are ligands then? Well, ligands are either neutral molecules mm. or charged ions with a lone pair of electrons. So what is yeah. happening is that the lone pair of electrons actually dative bond towards the central metal ion. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be transition, but of course when transition metals, um, we are talking about transition metal ions over here. And uh, usually it's accompanied by a charge of the overall complex itself. Okay, so um, why is it that transition metal ions um, can actually form complexes? There are actually two main reasons. Um, Mr. Tim, can you run me through the first one first? Well, the first one, right, the first one, the whole idea is that for you to accept the lone pair of electrons, mm. then you need to make sure that number one, you have d orbitals that are vacant, which means completely empty, mm. and not only that, low in energy, right, low lying, okay? And the second reason is this. Now, the reason for why you're forming covalent bonds, don't you find this a bit weird, Mr. Long? Because it is a metal, non-metal, right? Oh, okay. So, so by right, it's supposed to be ionic, yeah, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. but we are forming covalent because we have learned in chem bonding in J1, remember? It is supposed to be ionic, but because Fe3 plus has a very high charge density, mm. right? It results in a strong tendency to form covalent bonds because of the distortion of the electron cloud, mm. right? So it results in an electron cloud overlapping, giving rise to this covalent bonding character. That's right. Okay. So that is why at the end of the day, um, the bonding is going to be covalent dative, mm. right? And uh, let's take a look at this page over here. So we're still looking at complexes, yeah. but very specifically, we're going to look at this thing called aqua complex. So the only criteria that's additional to it is the fact that your ligands must be water. Okay. So one of the important properties that you must learn is that aqua complexes, some of them, they can actually give me a weakly acidic solution. So Mr. Tim, can you run me through why is that so? Yeah, sure. So first things first, right, to, for an aqua complex to be acidic, the mm. first criteria that you need is a transition metal ion with a high charge density. Mm. Now, what's a high charge density? We learned this in um, J1 bonding. First things first, a charge density is proportional to just Q over R, okay? Mm. So usually for transition metal ions, when your charge is very large, usually more than three plus or three plus and above, okay? This results in a high charge dense. Now, why does high charge density result in acidic solution? It's not too bad. Now, to better understand this, we first have to understand that the transition metal ion, right, like we said, it is surrounded by water, mo water molecules, right? Mm -hmm. So we have this Fe3 plus here, surrounded by six water molecules, okay? Now, because this Fe3 plus has high charge density, now Mr. Long, tell me out, right? If I have high charge density, do you think I like electrons? Uh, you, ha you like to suck electrons to yourself, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So because I have high charge density, I love to suck electrons towards myself. Mm -hmm. So focus on your electrons in the OH bond in one of the water molecules. Because I have high charge density, I'm going to pull these electrons, polarize it and pull it towards myself. You can see that happening. So now this OH bond now is polarized. Now it's because it's polarized, you can see how this hydrogen kind of just lost his electron here. And this H is kind of like H plus now, okay? Now, because this OH bond is polarized, it is very easy for this OH bond to snap open, right? So of course, polarized, very easy to break, and it releases off H plus, okay? Mm -hmm. So yes, this is how transition metal ions results in acidic solutions. Mm. So one of the things that's important for you to do is uh, to use an equation to illustrate this particular reaction. Mm. So that's why you see over, over here. Now this, uh, be careful, you have to uh, write it as a reversible arrow, okay? And uh, the whole idea over here is that the complex, uh, one of the H2O is going to break, break off its H+, mm -hmm. and as a result, uh, the, the, these are the products that's going to be formed. Okay, so this whole process is known as hydrolysis, which I think the name is quite telling. Uh, hydro means water, mm -hmm. lysis means breakdown. Mm -hmm. So you see that in this reaction itself, water is broken down. Uh, one of the H plus is being broken. Uh, oh, sorry, one of the OH bonds is being broken to release the H plus Correct. ions. Yeah, perfect. So what are the ions that uh, can potentially exhibit this kind of behavior? Um, Mr. Tim, can you run me through it? What are those? Yeah. So again, right, you need to have a high charge density. So mm. usually metal ions, right, with small radius, but high charge. So usually in the context of A-levels, we are looking at metal ions that has three plus charge and above. Mm -hmm. Fe three plus, Cr three plus, very common ones. Yeah? Yes. Uh, you also notice that from periodic table, there's mm -hmm. also another ion that also has a high charge density undergoing hydrolysis. Uh, yeah. uh, what is that? Uh? Aluminum three plus? That's right. Yeah. So you notice that because all of them undergo the same kind of reaction, mm -hmm. the equation that you write must be identical as yes. well, right? So um, you don't think of them as separate ideas, okay? So you have to uh, realize that they are actually exactly the same thing. Mm. Okay, Mr. Long, what I have here is six blue ligands, and what you have there is six red ligands, okay. right? Now, I don't like my blue ligands. It makes me very upset. Monday blues, right? So what I want, what I want to do, Mr. Long, is this. 
I want to swap my ligands with you because I don't like it. I'm okay. unhappy. I'm very unstable right now. Can we swap? Uh, sure, if you want to. Yes. Ah, okay. So when I have swap, now I'm more happy, and now I'm more stable. And this is basically what ligand exchange is about, you know. Then can you switch? Uh, I don't want to switch all. Can you just switch two for me? Ah, uh, sure, sure. Okay, fine, fine. So I will. Pick one, tell you what. Okay, we don't have to switch all. It's okay. I'm still relatively happy. I'm still relatively stable. Okay. Instead of switching six, fine, you, you, you greedy person. I'll give you one. Okay. I'll just take the blue one, okay? So again, we don't have to swap everything, right? So I'm still happy because I'm still stable. So at the end of the day, ligand exchange really depends on uh, different reactions, right? Yeah. So this must mean that in exam, you need to memorize. So one of the more important reactions in uh, complex, right, is this idea called a ligand exchange reaction, okay? Uh, what is happening over here is that there are certain complexes, right, they may bond better uh, with certain ligands itself. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. So let's look at example one. Okay. Uh, we start off with nickel uh, aqua complex, which okay. is uh, bonded to water, six of them, mm -hmm. right? And what happens if I throw in a bit of aqueous ammonia inside? Now, it turns out there's going to be an exchange of the ligands, mm -hmm. right? The H2O is going to come out and NH3 is going to replace it. So you're going to form a new complex that contains only just NH3 as the ligands itself. Ah. Okay. Uh, the reason, once again, I was telling you is because the one with the NH3 is actually a more stable complex. Mm. Okay. So Mr. Tim, um, do you think that um, the H2O, um, can it still act as a ligand over here? Yeah, it looks possible, right? It feels mm. like the H2O can actually come in, mm. right? You can see, I can actually go reverse. Mm. The H2O can swap away the ammonia ligands and I go backwards to form the aqua complex again, mm. right? So here's the thing, um, if I can go backwards and forward, Mr. Long, then this reaction is called a... A reversible reaction. Ah, okay. But, I mean, is the backward reaction really happening to such a great extent? Ah, unlikely, mm. right? Because I can see here, if the fact that I can form, I want to form this nickel ammonia complex, mm. right? This means that my POE lies more to the right, all right? Now, to bring this into better perspective, the moment I see a reversible reaction, mm. I start to already think, okay, if it's reversible, I can already always write an equilibrium constant, right? Yes. And if my POE lies very much to the right, then mm. my KC should be very great, very much greater than one. But Mr. Long, usually when we talk about ligand exchange and we talk about KC, do we really call it KC? Uh, no. So no. in this case, with respect to water, uh, uh -huh. the aqua complex, right? Uh, the we don't we, we call it a different name. Okay. So um, it actually reflects the stability of the new complex form, and that is why we call this the K step. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, like what Mr. Tim said, generally K step is a value that is much greater than one. Is to illustrate the fact that the new complex that is formed uh, is going to be more stable and is always with respect to the aqua complex. Okay. So that is by definition of the K step itself. Mm. Okay, uh, shall we illustrate that with an idea? Yeah, okay. Sure. So, Mr. Tim, can you run me through why? Uh, what is the significance of a large k step value? Yeah, sure. So, if the k step is much larger than one, like you can see there. Mm -hmm. First things first. This tells you that the nickel ammonia complex is way more stable mm. than the aqua complex, right? Mm. That's why I want to form. Okay. Mm. Now that means, of course, the POE will definitely lie very much to the right. Mm. Okay. That's why. I, that's why I form the nickel ammonia complex. Now, next thing is also this. If I really want to form the nickel ammonia complex, this means that my ammonia ligands must definitely form a stronger covalent bond or coordinate covalent bond compared to my water ligands, right? Mm. So you can see point three here, right? We form a stronger coordinate covalent bond with the nickel two plus ion. Mm -hmm. And of course, this clearly means that ammonia must be a stronger ligand than water. Now, finishing up and wrapping this off, it makes perfect sense. If ammonia is a stronger ligand than the water, therefore, when I add in my ammonia ligands, when I add in excess ammonia, I will definitely replace all my water ligands with ammonia. Makes perfect sense, okay? Now, so like we said, you can go on and I will further elaborate this using work example two. Mm. So what I have for you here is three different complexes with three different k-stability values, right? So you can see here, the smallest k-step value for FeCl4 minus and the larger k-step value, largest k-step value for FeCn6 3 minus. Now, of course, like we just said, the five points, if my k-step is very, very large, this means my complex is very, very stable, all right? So Mr. Long, do you mind? Can us run through this example with us? So once again, K-step is done with reference to uh, aqua complex. Yes. But that being said, right, uh, we can also still compare the different K-step values to know their relative stabilities uh, of these complexes itself. Okay. So we're going to start off uh, by looking at just a uh, FeCl4 minus uh, solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many write this in? This is going to be yellow color. Okay. And what's going to happen is if I add in SCN ions, that's called thiocyanide uh, ions. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to happen is that this SCN is a ligand, and when it uh, uh, bonds together with a Fe, you're going to form a complex that's more stable. So we're going to experience a ligand exchange reaction where the Cl minus, right, they are going to get exchanged with uh, SCN. And what happens is that you're going to form a new complex, the one that has a uh, SCN with 
H2O and there's five of them. Uh, this particular complex is very special. It is blood red in color. Okay, so one of the things that you remember once again from here, what must you pay attention to? Uh, to the fact that this is a ligand exchange. Ligand exchange must always be uh, what kind of uh, reaction? It must always have two headed arrows, right? Yeah, for sure. A reversible reaction. A reversible reaction, yeah. that's right. And the other thing that's important for you to do is you have to unfortunately memorize that the uh, complex with SCN must only have one of them. Yeah. The other five are all still water that's molecules. Right. Okay? Okay, so, all right, so last thing before we move on, you will also see that if I try to do the same thing, if I add in my theocyanate ligands, right, SCN minus, to my complex FECN6 3 minus, will I form this blood red complex again? Now you would see no, because it makes sense. You can see how the case stability for FECN6 3 minus is very large, and therefore I'm very, very stable. If I'm very, very stable, then why on earth do I want to swap my ligands away, mm. right? So of course, you can see when I add in SCN, I do to FECN6 3 minus, I do not form the blood red complex, mm. okay? And that's it. Okay, guys, now we're going to take a look at work example three, right? Complexes of copper two ions with water and ammonia. Now, before we begin, do you guys remember that in QA, right, in O levels and in A levels, when you test for copper two plus, you will add in a few drops of aqueous ammonia, then you will see this light blue PPT forming, right? And then when I add in excess aqueous ammonia, all of a sudden, this magic happens where your light blue PPT dissolves and this like deep blue solution comes in. And every time when I was in school, right, our teacher just told us to memorize, memorize, memorize. Can you finally explain this to me, Mr. Long? Uh, sure, no yeah, problem. Please. Okay, so I think first things first, based mm. on your first observation, uh, we say that when we add in aqueous ammonia, you are going to get a black blue precipitate, right? Mm. Uh, what is this black blue precipitate first? Well, it's going to be your copper hydroxide. Copper yeah. hydroxide. So mm. surprisingly, even though you add aqueous ammonia, you are getting hydroxide. The reason why is because ammonia is a weak base. Yeah. Uh, when it dissociates in water, it is going to release me small amounts of OH-, right? Mm -hmm. So the OH- over there will be the one responsible for reacting with a CO2 plus to give you a light blue precipitate. Okay. Now, what happens in the presence of excess ammonia is this. Now, you tell me that the copper 2 plus that is still present in the solution, right, mm. is going to form a more stable complex. And this complex is the one that has the NH3-4 inside. Uh -huh. okay? And uh, when we talk about this, we understood it from the idea from ligand exchange that your system will always try to form the more stable complex. Okay, so what's going to happen over here is that in the presence of uh, excess ammonia, we're going to set up this equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, you start off with the aqua complex. Okay, uh, why, why is there still aqua complex even though there's a precipitate, uh, Mr. Tim? Well, because not everything precipitates off. We have mm. learned this in KSP, mm. right? When you do precipitation, again, it's a reversible reaction. So not all the copper 2 plus ions forms a PPT, mm. just a little bit, right? or at least to some extent. So there'll be still a bit of copper 2 plus ions in the solution, mm. which can still complex with your ammonia. Okay. okay, so mm. that's why there is still aqua complex in the, in the solution yeah. and in the presence of excess ammonia, mm -hmm. this ammonia will come in to go and bond natively with the copper 2 plus and that is where you form this new, more stable complex, okay, the one that has an ammonia inside. Mm. Okay, so uh, in this case, let's talk about a bit of the chemistry. Uh, why is it that uh, the blue precipitate actually disappears? Uh, Mr. Tim, could you run us through that? I can already see it happening because mm. if I form this copper ammonia complex, right, it means that I'm consuming my copper 2 plus aqueous ions. Mm. So if I go back to the equilibrium 1, the first equilibrium that we saw just now, the formation of the PPT, if I consume my Cu2 plus, the corner of my Cu2 plus goes down. Now, according to Le Chatelet's principle, this is a change that I just made, right? So according to LCP, my PoE will now shift leftward to reverse that change, to mm -hmm. increase the corner of your Cu2 plus again. Now, when I shift backwards, you can see this means that my PPT will now dissolve. Right, because I'm going back. Okay, and that's it. Now, this is the Le Chatelet's principle, or this is how you explain it using position of equilibrium. Mm. Now, if you want to explain it using IP and KSP, you also can. Now, Mr. Law, can you help me with that one? So, I think one of the things that we need to understand is um, when, when it comes to this chapter itself, the one with the aqua complex and the one that just says Cu2 plus, we're going to treat it as identical. Mm. Okay, so um, how do we explain this using KSP concept? It's quite simple. So, like what Mr. Tim said, the moment you uh, look at the formation of the new complex, okay. uh, the Cu2 plus concentration is going to drop. And we are going to look at the uh, ionic product of my CuOH2. Ah. Okay, so remember that CuOH2 copper hydroxide is actually uh, insoluble. I can always set up this thing called the KSP expression. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen is um, if your Cu2 plus concentration drops, mm -hmm. the ionic product of copper hydroxide is going to drop as well. And at some point of time, this decrease is going to go below the KSP value of my copper hydroxide. And we learn from uh, KSP that if it, if it falls below it, you are going to see that the whole precipitate will not form and that is where you can use it to explain why the copper hydroxide, the blue precipitate, it actually dissolves. 
Ah, makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Okay, thank you, Mr. Long, for your for your intelligence on oh, this. Ah, thank you.